All right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Pop Goes the Sixties. I have with me Anthony Rotuno, a buddy of mine, that we are going to talk a little bit about get back and um hopefully you're not having any get back fatigue out there but there's so much to talk about anthony uh he's been on my show before here and why don't you just reintroduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your podcast and a couple of things you've got going on hi matt thanks for having me back i don't know why you'd want to have me back but anyway you know oh, come now. maybe come you now. had like a strange new year's turn or something anyway <laughs> now I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this um the only problem is there's nothing really to talk about with get back i mean i'm down to my last three thousand talking points <laughs> good luck if you can read this i think it's small children who'd be ashamed of that handwriting anyway, <laughs> and you're my brain goes too. my brain goes quicker than my hand sorry um <laughs> yes so i've got three podcasts the one that's most pertinent is glass onion on john lennon deep dive into john lennon and i will be this year and i'll hate myself if i don't do it i am going to write the book but i've already written quite a lot of it in fact so it's going to be a book based on the podcast but including some original stuff that i'm writing so trying to trying to connect myself with john lennon trying to think of all the things that i identified with him when i first became a fan so i'm trying to sort of connect those together i've got a couple of other podcasts film gold is films and then life and life only is kind of psychology and there's a little bit of crossover between them but yeah mm -hmm. the john lennon one is still my main one and happy new year well, yes. Happy New Year. And I'm glad to hear this book is going to see the light of day here. Well, yeah. One of, yeah, actually a lot of uh, a lot of psychology books say if you want to do a project, you have to commit yourself and then you'll do it. So you have to tell as many people as possible. I'm telling everyone that I'm going to write it this year. So I'll be so ashamed if I don't do it that, that I'll have to do it. So. You have to do it. Yep. I, yeah. I think that works. That psychology yeah. works. I find myself <laughs> doing the same thing. Yeah, we've got to cheat yourself, you see. That's what psychology mm -hmm. is about. <laughs> well, let's start by talking. Uh, Get Back obviously has been talked about by many, many people. I've seen so many people on YouTube who typically don't do music or Beatles videos weighing in, and that's great. Um, so let's. what was your, your impression? Because you've watched it twice, I yeah. believe, right? And just your general first impressions. Oh, I mean, it's difficult to say, but the first time I watched it, I remember sitting down to watch it. And I was thinking, because I left it about, I was going to leave it longer, in fact, but I left it about 10 days probably for, for the initial kind of mm -hmm. buzz to wear down a little bit. Yeah, I just remember sitting down to watch the first episode and thinking, you know, this is this is the only time I'll ever be watching Get Back for the first time. And it was, I was a tiny bit disconcerted because if you notice in that intro, Mm -hmm. um, and I defend that intro, by the way. I know a lot, a lot of diehards have been saying, "Oh, they shouldn't have had, shouldn't have been that long." But remember, it's a product; they've got to try and sell it to the, yes. the casual fan who outnumbers mm -hmm. the hardcore fans. Um, I was a bit disconcerted because there were there were some really glaring errors right at the beginning. They said John and Paul met in 1956, and George was 13. And yes, I was thinking, wow, how did that get passed? But you were correct about that. I'd forgotten about that, but I did catch that as well. I was like, oh boy, here we go again. You know? Yeah, it's very weird because I was wondering, God, what else? What else? What other errors are there going to be? But no, the the first one, I would say, the only slight criticism or the slight jarring thing was where. The audio and the video seem to sometimes match perfectly, sometimes almost match, and then sometimes not match. But I suppose the first time I viewed it, it I could never really be, I could never get a clear picture because I was thinking, you know, wow, this is get back. And then when you invited me to do this, I sat down again to watch it and I started making notes. And, uh, you know, no joke, I just wore out my hand making notes. Mm -hmm. But I think. It was great for me to see on video a lot of the stuff that I'd heard in the Nagra Reels. Yeah. Because I did do the whole Nagra Reels up to about six days before the end. Mm -hmm. So that that was nice to have that. And it, I think it was just, I think it was more, um, I knew that we would discuss the narrative, which we will. But the footage was really the thing for me. And I, I, I was just loving it, you know. And it, it's just, it was too much to take in the first time. But now I've sort of taken a step back. I just, I just think it's a major, major um, addition to the canon, isn't it? Really, that's a great yeah. way to put it. This, it's, mm. it's huge. I think people will be mm. using "Get Back" as the way to understand how they worked together, how they didn't work together, um, mm. how they collaborated in other ways other than music, how they communicated. So, yeah, I think this is 
this is one of the biggest pieces that could have been added and it, we came very close to it never being added at all mm -hmm. so we're very lucky as beetle fans and uh, i think that it'll take some time for fans and non-fans and journalists to digest it and uh, put it in its proper place because it's still so new yeah i did want to say one thing that i haven't actually read any reviews purposely the only comments i mean obviously that i've read comments online but i i listened to richard buskey and eric taras's mm. three-part thing they did it like straight after watching it so they'd get like a very organic mm -hmm. reaction and then i listened to one of peter jackson's interviews yes so because i find that if you just if you do discuss something too much or you, or you listen to too much it does influence the way you look at it you know so there are certain moments from the film that are quite rightly being um kind of lauded like the bit of Paul composing get back yeah. strumming his bass yeah it's a great moment but I suppose I, I just didn't want to read too many uh reviews and things because I wanted to and I, I know you did another appearance as well and I, I just wanted to keep it fresh for this one really yeah and I didn't even watch it completely a second time yet and I was trying uh, to keep fresh too just because I it's just so much I, I will watch it again and I keep paying my monthly Disney fee, so I don't know how long that's going to go before I get through it a second time. But yeah, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, generally, I just I was somewhat overwhelmed. Um, I did a, a like you had mentioned, I had done a, another discussion of this uh, uh, three part discussion, and we've got three more parts to go here with completely different topics, and we could do another one with three more topics. So there's so much to talk about here. And I think it's completely worth talking about. Um, so let's get started on, we've got three three little topics to go over here, over in this okay. segment. And the thing that uh, I wanna start with has to do with, uh, I guess we would call this uh, somewhat of an editorial take that Peter Jackson gave us, which, and let's be honest, this whole thing is his view. So it's not like we're getting, a completely new narrative or some kind of truth thing but and this was most most evident to me in the exclusion of yoko ono and the intrusionary parts that we've we've know we know exist he didn't use mm. any of it mm. now peter jackson in a couple of videos he's talked about having carte blanche about doing whatever he wanted and i do take him at his word on that so because some people suggest oh he was he was told not to do that by the by people at apple etc i don't know that i, I take him at his word so there's got to be a reason why he did not include the yoko ono stuff and there's really two parts and i'll just briefly go over those so i did videos on both of them so i know them quite well hmm. and um, so the first one has to do with yoko ono chipping in ideas for the live show and that was a rather lengthy conversation. And what's notable there is John Lennon is letting Yoko do all the talking for her. And everybody else is just kind of pitching in ideas as well. And then the next thing was a few days later after George left the group and they had a failed meeting with George at Ringo's house where Yoko was also doing the talking for John. Now that information, that meeting is not captured on the Nagger Reels, but the discussion by the band is. Yes. And... So I was really disappointed. Now I'll give you now my channel. I've, I've done several get back uh, preview of it or, or pre. Um, what I can tell you is the feedback I got from a lot of my viewers is that, oh, Yoko wasn't an issue at all. She didn't help break up the Beatles. I literally got that response from at least a dozen viewers. So I know that that made it some impact. And I think that Jackson, he didn't do the story justice by omitting that. I think that was an issue. What is your take on that? Yeah, I suppose it was a bit strange, but I suppose on the Nagra tapes, you don't really hear her that much. You, you, you're absolutely right. The day after the meeting, you, you've got, you've even got Neil, I, don't, I can't remember if this was in the film, but you've got Neil and Linda kind of weighing in. Because I think Linda went to that meeting but didn't talk. But she weighs in, and so clearly there is an issue. Mm -hmm. I think they did a good job of showing that Yoko Ono was and is, you know, a human being who's can be relatively normal. You know, I think one of the things from the film actually is that these guys, you know, obviously they're they're megastars. It's hard for them to have a normal life, but 
you see the very normal moments and with Yoko there were little bits like um, there's a great bit where Yoko's doing a sort of ah into the mic and, mm -hmm. and you see little Heather uh, give that amazing I can't even describe it it's, it's that kind of it's sort of strange look and I think that what we're going to get on to later about the cinematic thing they may well have used a reaction shot of Heather that wasn't that particular one but I'd forgive them that because it you know, well the it, thing is that Here's one thing I would add to that, whether Jackson mm. used the actual reaction or not, he mm. used the reaction of Heather and not one of the other Beatles. Yes, yes. That was something I wrote down, actually. Yeah, we, we got Heather's. Yeah, we got Heather's reaction rather than. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say there is, it seemed to me, um, I noticed a couple of things in the film. The bits where Yoko was doing her kind of caterwauling or whatever you want mm -hmm, to call it. Mm -hmm. The first time George wasn't there, and again, I don't know if this is an editorial. Did you notice that she stopped just as George entered the building? I didn't notice if, that. You probably notice that if you watch it again. I'm okay. sure that's right, because the second time I was I was looking out for it. So it, it seemed to be again. You're absolutely right. It's an editorial decision, but it seemed to be George and Yoko, and you you'd kind of think George might be into some of her stuff. But he sort of clearly isn't. And then the second time, now the first time he's not there, she's doing that mm -hmm. sort of squawking or screaming, whatever you want to call it. And I like a lot of her work, by the way. I'm not making fun of her. But mm -hmm. I guess squawking would be a word for it. Yeah. Um, George isn't there. And the second time, I think, as I said, just as he's entering the building, she stops. Which so is an apple, I think. I think it might be, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then be. you get you get Paul kind of gives his speech about, oh, you know, John's more into Yoko than he is to us, than he's into yeah. us. Mm -hmm. And Paul doesn't seem to have a problem. And then obviously he's bringing Linda, which mm -hmm. kind of evens it out. I'm not saying he's doing it for that reason, but he's kind of saying, well, if you're going to bring your girlfriend, then I'll bring mine. Um, I don't know. Do you, can I ask question, you a question? Was there a lot on the, was there a lot of Yoko on the Nagra tapes? Cause I don't really remember it too well, much. Well, when you said you don't hear her a lot, um, mm. that's true. You don't hear her on the Niagara reel as much at all. I've listened to over mm. 90 hours of it. Where you do hear her when she's engaging in uh, uh, these discussions, which, or the, the one discussion, which the band wasn't playing. So it's not like mm. she was interfering in them rehearsing. Um, in, the, in the Peter Jackson, you don't hear her either, but you see her. So what you said, mm. uh, it, the film to me, Jackson humanized her in quite a number of ways, which was probably all, always there. I mean, I, one, the thing I noticed about Yoko, the only time she is engaged in any way, smiling or tapping her foot or grooving to the music is when it's one of John's songs. She is stone-faced through everything else, doesn't laugh at any jokes. That's one of the things on the Niagara Reels you do here is her not laughing at the jokes. And right. if you watch her on the rooftop at the end when Maureen is clapping and really excited for the band, she's like stone-faced. So she has a what I would consider a, a despondent or detachment from what they're actually doing. And... I don't know. That's not good or bad. I don't. I don't think she really interfered too much. I just feel that Jackson needed to put that in because obviously Yoko showed up during the White Album sessions and she was there through the Abbey Road sessions. So this is just one month, and she, so she's really there eighteen of those months. Mm. And um, so as as for Paul bringing Linda, I mean, some people have have said have. May look at that as an equal thing. Oh, well, Linda's in the studio. It's like, no, man, this is the deal. Linda was not ever putting herself, injecting herself into band meetings and decisions. In fact, the meeting that she went to at Ringo's where George walked out, part of the discussion afterwards was Linda saying, I don't think we should have even been there. You know, and Paul kind of made a joke of it. So, well, it's such a lovely, how can you resist going to Ringo's on a weekend? Mm -hmm. But Linda has that awareness of her place as a Beatle girlfriend slash wife in mm -hmm. the bigger scope. Yoko's does not see herself in the same place Linda sees herself. And yeah. Yoko's silence throughout all of Beatle history up to this day proves that. Mm. I think. Maybe, you know, Maybe she wasn't into the music. You gotta remember that as well. That's perfectly fine, but it's an issue of yeah. knowing her place and what's 
maybe harming the band mm -hmm. and what discussion she may have had with John after, I don't know, because once, I mean, she's certainly, by the time they get back to Apple, she's not really chiming in much at all. I don't know if John mm -hmm. said, hey, keep your yap shut, or she, she said to John, hey, I don't think I should really talk for you. Might have been her idea. We don't know. But she seems a little bit more, uh, she's not chiming in as much after the Twickenham uh, stuff. So, And when she did chime in, it really wasn't, I don't think it made her look bad. Her, mm -hmm. Some of her suggestions are actually quite good. So this isn't a Yoko bashing session here. This is a Peter Jackson issue where he decided not to use her. And he gave the impression uh, that she was not a problem at all. Yeah. That was the impression. Yeah. I mean, I, I just recently reread Peter Doggett's book, You Never Give Me Your Money, which is ah. one of the seminal Beatles books. Oh, absolutely, awesome. absolutely brilliant. Awesome. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And you really get the impression from that that um, aside from what was happening at that time, since then, you know, ever since then, the 50 years since then, anytime there's any Beatles product or anything, there's always a lot going on. You know, if we take Doggett his word, there's always a lot going on behind the scenes. So I wouldn't say Peter Jackson was strong armed into anything. But at the same time, he's not going to go on a podcast and say, well, you know, I had Yoko, Paul and Ringo in, and well, who would it be now? Yoko, uh, what's George's wife, Olivia. Yes. You know, he's not going to say that they're all in his ears. So he's, he's not, I'm not saying he's lying or anything, but I think... You know, I'm only going on a hunch. I think that yep. there would definitely have been a bit of uh, pressure. There may have been even, even just friendly, pressure. yeah, or even just sort of friendly pressure, if that exists. Yes. I completely because <laughs> you know? what when I say mm. I take Peter Jackson at his word, indeed, mm. it may be his. He is being truthful. It was his decision, but it was also his decision to leave things out. So I'll give him either of those, but uh, the decision to leave that out, whether it was he felt pressure or not, I think does not tell the whole story. He had eight hours yeah. to just insert 20 seconds here, maybe of each incident, 40 seconds yeah. that would have at least gave more accuracy to the proceedings. He didn't do it. Yeah, and it's one of the strange things. I'm bothered by that. Yeah. But, you know, it's not the, I mean, we have, I mean, here, but the thing is, all of this stuff, you can't just rely on one source to give you all the information. So Get Back is not going to give us all the source. So I've got two videos on the both of the Yoko issues. So I consider that to be part of an explanation if people can find it. We've got books, we've got other things. You've got the, you just mentioned Doggett's book. So it's a, an accumulation of all this into one really that tells more. Yeah, the, the weird thing about Get Back is that it, it's probably, this film, it's probably too much for the casual fan. But yeah. for us, it's not enough because, as you said, it, it's it's still only you know. I mean, I, I, we were always told fifty six hours. Maybe it's even sixty. So this is like one seventh or one th one eighth of what's actually there. So I think last time I was on, we talked about you know drinking ourselves sober with Beatles knowledge. You know, you kind of you circle back and you end up back at square one. But I think I think it's maybe answered a few questions. But I, I to be honest, I don't. Th I think the film is great as for Beatles footage for people like us and, and your viewers and my listeners, I think it works as a kind of reality sh reality show slash soap opera slash almost family drama because the, the Beatles were like a family really, weren't they? So yeah. I think it works on that level. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily answered anything and I don't think it's even provided that much clarity because as you said, it, it's just a fraction yeah so it's it's more a kind of entertaining i think i'm i think i was probably more focused or i'm trying to be more focused on what's there than what's not there because what's not there is right. it says it's a little bit glaring at times yeah i, I agree mm. um but i disagree with i think we have more clarity on certain things yeah. uh with regard to narratives so in other words this idea that quote let it be was all misery or mm. that it was a disaster. All those ideas have been now shown to be maybe only partially true with it because Get Back did show the negatives, but it showed a lot of positives. So that I think that's new information. That's a, that's a, a new way to sum up these proceedings where, whereby it, it's not all bad, it's not all good either, but there is good. 
Yeah. And we saw that with our own eyes. The other thing too is the John and Paul collaboration. I think that's impossible to miss. So that to me yeah. goes against what Lennon kind of said here and there after the Beatles broke up. Um, so I think that's another one. Did I have a third one? I, I can't remember, it escapes me. But I, I do think okay. that this does give us more information to really just get a better understanding of them, how they work together, what, what they were going through. It doesn't give everything. But it gives yeah, no, no, yeah, no, fair enough, yeah. I mean, it's probably put yeah, a couple more of the puzzle pieces together. You're right, yeah. I suppose oh. I'm saying that it, there's nothing, I'm not sure there's anything definitive because we know how much footage isn't there. And I'm not blaming Peter Jackson for that because sure. it, in a funny way, it's almost, I mean, I don't know if they've recouped their money, but it's almost commercial suicide really to make an eight hour documentary, mostly for the casual fan. I mean, it's a crazy thing to do. I mean, we, well, let me get I'm, back I'm very to grateful that. to him. But <laughs> yeah, let me get back to that in a second. I just was going to say something else. I sure. think I lost it. Um, we were talking about, um, I guess the length and everything. So the, you talked about this being the get back not long enough for hardcore fans, but too long for the casual fans. Well, right. here's yeah. what, and I, I'm getting a little bit more experience with the so-called hardcore fan. Mm. And um, what basically happens is if they were shown certain people, if they're shown all 60 of the hours, what they're going to say then is, well, we don't know what was happening when the, they were at home or when the cameras weren't on. And of there's, course. There's, there's, and we don't. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. that's a fair statement. But mm. what? But they're asking, what I feel is when they're asking to see the 60 hours, that they're actually going to get more information than what they have now. I think they probably won't get any more. Right. There might be a couple little anecdotal things they'll get. And I, I, I also want to talk about just film production because you, you, you're a film guy. So if we give these people that want to see all 60 hours what they actually want, mm. and I think that some, since there was two cameras set up in many instances, I think you're going to get duplication. You're going to just get the same stuff from two different angles. So let's say you, you took a timeline and chronologically put it all in a timeline, 60 hours long. Okay, let the hardcore fan watches it. Well, what do they do with that information? I guess they can just never speak of it again. Or if they do talk about it or write about it, that will be an edit. It'll be their view. So you can't yeah. ever get away from editing this. And the longer it is, the more need for editing. So I, I think people just don't understand film production very well, because generally with any documentary, you're going to have 85% of what you shot goes in the trash can. So not everything is good. I mean, you use your best stuff. And obviously, uh, Hog couldn't maybe use the best stuff in 90 minutes, but it's incredibly difficult. And what people I think are asking, they're asking for the moon. You know, they're just not going to get what they want. I, I mean, well, I, I, I'm not going to get what I want. There's some unreleased songs I would wish they did proper. I'm not going to get that. So yeah. I think we need to stop asking for it or acting like we should get it. I think. Yeah, but let me say, I was kind of meant it slightly amusingly. And I kind of meant it as a compliment to Peter Jackson, because I'm uh, I'm mm -hmm. saying, you know, the eight hours was so amazing, like yeah. the, the clarity of it and everything that was in it. I, I kind of mean it like that, you know. I mean, if, the, if there was a 60-hour limited edition, I would buy it and I would watch it. Yeah. But I still, yeah. I still would definitely would not tell myself, oh, this is the truth, because as you said, I mean, you've been talking to Aaron, I've been tackling this for three years on glass onion you know yeah there's no there's no truth i mean even, even if you even if you had a one-on-one -on -one with a person particularly a famous person like they were mega famous they're not gonna they're not even gonna tell you the truth or the whole truth you know if you had a one-on-one -on -one with john lennon if you correct spent if you spent a week with john lennon with nobody else there not even yoko you know so um uh, yeah I'd, I'd probably say you're right you know there's little bits of clarity I think the creative bits, I mean, me as a musician, uh, I just I just love that. When John and Paul and George are working together well, it's just fantastic. It's dynamite, you know? And yes. Let's um let's get back. We're gonna talk about that briefly. The sure. way the three what you refer to as the three brothers. And I I, I yeah. added the three brothers plus Ringo. But before we do that, I wanna just <laughs> yeah. close the uh, paragraph on 
Peter Jackson's editorializing in Get Back. So I mentioned the Yoko Ono. And the other thing that kind of bookends it to me is his portrayal and the way he used uh, the introduction of Alan Klein. I will go so far to say is that it's almost as if he positioned that to suggest that that is the reason the Beatles broke up. That's yet to come. Mm. Almost by, and by, if you couple that with not putting the Yoko intrusionary stuff in, to me, there's maybe a slight connection there. He was trying to make that, hey, Yoko isn't the one that broke it up. It's this Klein fella. I, 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 I had a hard time separating those two things. What are your thoughts on that? I would say, yeah, I know what you mean. I would say it's more John's reaction to Klein. Although, if you remember, uh, towards the end, there's that great bit where John's talking to George and said, oh, I met this Alan Klein guy last night. He knows everything. He knows me better than I know myself. So you get the impression Klein's probably one of these people who's very, very good at kind of interpersonal psychology, let's call it, you know. Oh, yeah. He knows all the best buttons to press. I think, you know, again, just to refer to Doggett's book, high-end high capitalism, high-level capitalism is serious business. Oh, yes. And it brings out the worst in people from all my experience. Not that I've mm. ever been involved in it, but, you know, from what you read and stuff. Um, so I think, I'm sure Klein did play him a bit. And I don't know if there's those quotes that he'd been after the Beatles since 1964. I've got no idea if that's true. Tell me if it is. Tell me if you know it is or not. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, it, it's this John reaction because it's very interesting when he's talking to George and George is, George is being very nice. He's like, oh, really? You know, so genuinely interested. But then John says to him, oh, he's going to look after my stuff, whatever happens. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that is a, quite a serious, that's quite a serious statement, you know, because the other guys well, haven't even met him. Yeah. So what I do know is that <clears throat> John Lennon actually... He didn't formally meet Klein at the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, which was also a Michael Lindsay Hogg affair. Uh, Klein was there and Lennon and Yoko met him, I think, on January 26th formally, whatever day that was. I'm not positive. But yeah. so he, it was late in the evening. The next morning, Lennon is all in. <clears throat> now, one of the things about John Lennon, which... I don't know, this guy's the most gullible guy in the face of the earth. I mean, you saw Glenn, jo Glenn Johns uh, pulling punches because he knew what Klein was like. And then he's dealing with Lennon, his boss, essentially, yeah. and realizing, oh, shit, Lennon is enamored with this guy. I got to do a little tiptoe in here, which mm -hmm. Glenn Johns did. <clears throat> now we know the history of how Lennon just bought it hook, line, and sinker. And I mean, Give Klein credit, man. He played him like a cheap violin and, and used Yoko as well to, to yeah. full maximize getting Lennon under him. So that history has been told, but and we most of us, us rabid Beatle fans know that. So we can put that on what we saw in the Jackson film in some ways. It's impossible not to. Mm. And I think Jackson sure. knew that. He knew that. I mean, I don't think that was you didn't even have to use any of the Klein stuff. I don't think that's even really pertinent too much that's maybe more important to if you're doing a documentary on abbey road i don't if you if if jackson had not used that i would not have said boo about that well let me just say one thing um uh when i, when I was on a two leg show a few weeks mm -hmm. ago they were asking me what were the highlights and i said probably the rooftop but in a funny way, knowing the Klein stuff, because there's a couple of, I think he met him at the Rock and Roll Circus, then he, then he meets him once and then he meets him again. I think he meets him twice in January mm -hmm. for two meetings and they're up till two in the morning, whatever. I think it, it almost made the rooftop more special because you realise as they're getting off the roof, again, referring to Doggett's book, you know, it's pretty much, I know there were some good moments and they, I know they get on, they got on during Abbey Road, but I think that was more to do with they all wanted to leave on a high. It was something to do with professional pride. Um, yeah. So I think the rooftop is this sort of magic forty-five minutes where they're still together. And then if you if you if you look at the timeline, it's kind of downhill from there. As soon as the Klein Eastman thing starts. Uh, so I, I think the Klein thing, yeah, it was an editorial choice, but that's almost pointing to the future. Yes. I think that's more for us because, like I said, to a casual fan, they probably wouldn't even know who Alan Klein is. Yeah. And there's just 
you know, to them, like, what's the point of this brief mention of him? Because we don't see the culmination, but we know the culmination. So mm -hmm. I think from the Peter Jackson interview I listened to, which was quite a long one on um, uh, something about the Beatles, <coughs> it seems Peter Jackson is a genuine, fairly hardcore fan. Yes. Fairly hardcore. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure over the four years he became that. So I think he stuck a couple of bits in for you and I, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll go along with that. <clears throat> I'll go along with that. Uh, but it just feels to me that it seems a little bit out of place. Uh, obviously, the Dick James stuff, there's so many things he put in for us fans, so many. And the Beatles put it in for us, really, because that's just how they communicate. So I, I like the fact that Jackson used that. It's a small... I just, I, if I had Jackson on, I would ask him that question, how he handled that in, in tandem with the Yoko issue, because I think what, what had, what I've, my, the feedback I got was that, oh, Yoko's not a problem at all. Oh, Klein is the guy. He's the problem. He's, he's the breakup. That's just how people simplify it. But I think that's a, I, I listen to that because that's really the surface of what people get out of it. And I think that's, what's going to help build the next narrative or, you know, um, adjusted in some ways. I think that's worth talking about. Well, I think if you say to people, mm -hmm. oh, you know, we don't know anything, it's kind of, you know, it's raining on everybody's parade, isn't it? Isn't it? You know, yeah, we, 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 we want to think, you know, we know a little bit. And uh, I, yeah. I say to my listeners, my after three years, my best guess is getting slightly better mm -hmm. as time goes on. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, of course. And, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think simple narratives are always easier, yeah, as we know. Um, I mean, yeah, there's other podcasts, uh, Beatles ones that, that probably spent 30, 40, 50 hours um, discussing John and Paul. I mean, it's endlessly fascinating. It's endless, yeah. It is. But, uh, well, well let's, yeah. let's add to it. Um, we've got it. The next topic we're going to talk about has to do with what you call the three brothers. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> I had a three brothers plus Ringo and the dynamic of the collaboration and songwriting. So why don't you uh, get the ball rolling? Sure. Um, I mean, it is four brothers, really, but I'd say Ringo. I, I can't remember who, who was it who was saying that oh, they really like Ringo because he doesn't talk much. But when he does, it's always something very wise. Yeah, so Mark even John Lewis had said that. And so I've Mark repeated Lewis. that. Oh, right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a lovely bit that I remembered from the Nagra tapes that I was really pleased was in the film, was, was Linda saying, oh, I, I really love Ringo, and Michael Lindsay Hogg mm -hmm. says, yeah, I do too. And she says, he's the one I feel most comfortable with. So in a funny way, Ringo, Ringo emerges from the Beatles story as kind of the hero, really, because he's, and I think a lot of it comes from his childhood, because he was supposed to have died many times when he was a mm -hmm. kid serious illnesses so i think he was the most grateful for being alive in a way so, yeah so i think i think ringo kind of emerges as the hero of it really but um he's somewhat apart because i think obviously he's on the drum riser at the back and the, he doesn't really get involved too much in the construction of the songs unless it's obviously his song mm -hmm. um but with john paul and george I, you know the, the bits where they're just in a circle working on the songs i said earlier and I particularly like it when they're working on George's stuff. Um, for example, what's the one? For You Blue. Mm -hmm. I love that bit where they put the paper in the piano to get that weird oh, yeah. piano sound. Mm -hmm. And then John's got the Hawaiian guitar. Um, you know, they, they really, they just emerge more and more as, as brothers with all, with all the sibling rivalry, you know? Um, and I was thinking, you know, to be, to be a technician, to be one of those cameramen, if you're a Beatles fan, I mean, this is just the best seat in the house, you know, watching John Lennon, Paul McCartney and George Harrison working, saying, oh, you know, should we do this verse twice? Or, you know, should we do this? You know, it's beautiful. You know, it's, it's really lovely. Yeah, I really think nice. that when you say, um, how did you just say it? Uh, you got the three brothers and how they're positioned. They're, they're more together. And I would say they're, John, Paul and George are more together figuratively and literally, especially in the Get Back film, because mm. you see the three of them on the ground in chairs facing each other yeah. ringo's on the drum riser behind so ringo figuratively speaking he's not with them as much because he's not a song he's not a writer on their level at all he's there's no ego clash there's no 
competitiveness in that in that regard. And there's no clash with uh, creating or keeping one down or bringing suggestions. He's just there to support. Yeah, so then yeah. he's also literally apart from them. Mm-hmm. And the thing that impressed me the most, because having listened to 90 hours of the Niagara Reels, is how he just was in lockstep with them, completely paying attention at all times and falling in and out exactly when he needs you. They didn't have to look at him. And that I think is huge. And they weren't keeping him out. They weren't even looking at him. They were, it was like, he could have been in a sound booth somewhere else doing the same thing. But um, that's the part of the the three, the three brothers, the right, the songwriters that they were really working together in a way that impressed me. And you, oh, even, even when there was, even when there wasn't harmonious, they were still working together in a way that was just really cool and impressive. And even George yeah. said when they got to Apple, you know, after all the issues with two of us, when Paul and George had that flare up at Twickenham, George, when they get to Apple and they're finishing off the song, he says something like, wow, after all that angst with this song, it turned out really good. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they, I they seem to be able to get past themselves. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it, it came to music anyway. I think maybe the casual fan also wouldn't know that Ringo is the oldest, of course. I mean, only by a few months, but mm-hmm. when, when you when you think of Ringo as the oldest, it, it takes on it. It's almost like he's a slightly wiser guy looking at his three younger <laughs> brothers, <laughs> even just by four months or whatever it is. And kind of, you know, they're, they're the creatives having all their tension and I'm here and I'm ready. And I think he's very quiet just because he doesn't like the morning. So there's, there's one where he says, oh, I'm not too good this morning. Yeah. You know, we know they're all night owls. You know, they didn't really appreciate starting at 10 o'clock. Um, so there's that to fact that there's, there's often very, very simple explanations for things, you know. Um, I think, yeah, I agree with you. I think that John Paul and George had a, a respect for Ringo be, because he was older. And, you know, obviously these, the hierarchy or the the birth order in this, these four guys does matter. This goes back because they were, they've been together since they were kids. Sure. And they knew Ringo as kids, roughly speaking, though he wasn't in the band right at the beginning. And I think that the Ringo is just given a re- he's got to respect he was in the biggest skiffle group he was in the biggest band before the beatles got big and i think that still carries over and he doesn't have to say much and they the, the, john paul and george for all their passive aggressive discussion they never seem to put that on ringo ringo gets no. he's the glue to everything he no matter what those three what's going on with those three and the problems those three have with one another and it could switch off at any given time ringo doesn't have that those issues with those three and he's yeah. kind of the the buoy of the band i mean they can, if they got to hang on to him they can do it they do it musically clearly in these sessions yeah yeah it seems like ringo's demons came out to play in the 70s which is probably yeah. to do with the band breaking up i'd say and he had yeah. a yeah. he had a kind of a promising solo career at the beginning and he made some films but i think after a while he realized that he was in a sense the biggest loser of them breaking up really but i think at this point he was probably reasonably happy i mean he was building up a family as we know he had a couple of kids by by this time didn't he yeah ringo um, in the 70s I, that's that's a great video topic we'll have to practice <laughs> yeah. <in> time. <laughs> that's a great absolutely one. yeah it all kind of came crashing down but i mean all four of the beatles you know you've reviewed the riding so high but yeah. and i've reviewed it as well they all had their drug and drink problems at, sometimes at different points of their life but yeah I think at this point, as I say, you know, Ringo's, he's getting ready to do the Magic Christian. Yeah, he's probably thinking, oh, you know, my film career is taking off. So mm-hmm. I think I think in Pete Shotton's book, very good book, I think it's called In, in My Life, I think it's called In My Life, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Like John Lennon In My Life or something, Pete Shotton's book, very mm-hmm. good book. Um, he, he talks about Ringo as a second-class Beatle. And I think that kind of meant creatively, perhaps, because I don't think they ever looked down on Ringo at all. I think they, I think they so. looked up to him, like I said, in a weird way. And there's a quote from John in the anthology uh, where he says, you know, Ringo had a beard. Ringo was a grown-up. Mm-hmm. As you said, and again, Lewison's tune-in book uh, said this as well, Ringo was always actually about one rung higher on the showbiz ladder than they were. Yeah. You know, he was in the Eddie Clayton Skiffle, blo- Skiffle Group, which was much higher profile than the Quarrymen. Mm-hmm. And then he was in Rory Storm, which was probably the best group in Liverpool until the Beatles 
went to mm. Hamburg or came back from Hamburg. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. So I think drummers, they, they tend to be either kind of the glue that holds them together or they're just complete lunatics like Keith Moon and John Bonham. It seems to go mm. one of those two ways, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and obviously it's, it's sort of symbolic as well because the drummer is holding everything together. You know, the drummer is giving you the beat and everything goes on top of it. Yes. Generally in a rock band, the, the, the bass follows the drums and everything else follows the bass and drums. So he's literally the rock. He's musically the rock. And I think he's the ro he was the rock in their lives. As you said, that changed, unfortunately, for him in the 70s. But yeah, I think that's the dynamic. Yeah. So they, they needed him badly, I think. And I think it shows in this get back. thing. that's another takeaway, I think, that I get from. Um, and I guess so having listened to the Nagger Reels, maybe I get that more. But mm. this get back film by Jackson, I think, shows Ringo's value. Because this, I mean, it, the guys were just, they were so unprepared. They were rusty. I mean, and Ringo didn't sound rusty. <laughs> he yeah. just did his thing. Well, in Lewison's recording sessions book, I think he, because Mark Lewison's heard everything that they ever recorded in Abbey Road, apparently. Um, which she said was, it's, kind of, it's probably akin to watching 60 hours of Get Back. It's probably great up to a point, but then after a while, you think, eh, not all of this is great. Um, but he said, you know, of all the recording sessions they had, Ringo very, very rarely was the one that that, that broke the tape down by making a mistake. Correct. In fact, he said he was amazed how few mistakes he made. In seven, eight years of all the recordings, all those takes, he his estimate was 11 or 12 times out of yeah. probably 1,000. That's right. More, I don't know. Yeah. And I think Ringo, Ringo, was, Ringo was the most traditional kind of northern english working man you know more maureen you know how um this, this is very old-fashioned now probably wouldn't get away with even saying this but the old idea of the, of the man going to the office and coming home and his wife's got his dinner on the table at yes. six o'clock or you know maureen used to wait for ringo apparently and be we used to wait up for ringo but mm. yeah, slightly different in this world because mm. Ringo might come home at five in the morning, you know, after yeah. a recording session. But you can imagine him coming home at five in the morning and Maureen going, oh, how was your day, dear? And Ringo would go, ah, oh, it was all right. Paul annoyed me a bit, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just to say, I think Ringo's kind of almost the hero of this story in a funny way. Yeah, I, you I know? agree. <laughs> um, just one other thing, if you don't mind. Sure. To do with this creativity. I had forgotten, did you, do you remember that the argument, the John and Paul argument was on the 6th? And he didn't walk out till the tenth. The George and Paul. Sorry, George and Paul. Yeah, yeah. The argument about you know play whatever you want me to play. Mm -hmm. I kind of forgotten that he walked out four days later. Yes. I knew he didn't walk out straight after that. I knew that, but I didn't realize it was actually four days. And I think I think a lot of it comes from they just had two different working methods at that time. Uh, Paul wanted to stop things and get it right, and then move on to the next bit. And George wanted to keep playing, and so it sort of organically which would have been very much in line with the band and Bob Dylan, because when they did the basement tapes, the, yeah, the, they I, recorded hundreds of hours. And they just, they'd say, oh, you know, it'll work, you know, we'll, I think, we'll ease into it. I did a video on the argument and that's my most watched video. So no, I, I've watched over, it. Yeah. Over a half a million views and the, the responses from people fall on both sides. George was being bitchy, Paul was being bitchy, but really, I think you hit it. I think they had two different working methods and George was trying to improvise as he went along, which is, I think, what a guitar player would do. Mm. Paul had some ideas of the arrangement. Um, and I don't know, I think the reason that argument even happened is because Paul brought up Hey Jude. It, it was a sore subject to Paul. Yeah. Paul. Paul has a way of saying some stupid shit up to this day not realizing who he's talking to. And I think he did that with George at that, at that point. And um, because I, I don't find, yeah, they're both, pat, George could be more passive aggressive, <clears throat> I think than anybody else in the band. But I think that he had some valid points and to their credit, they kept slogging it out, kept working on it. They got past it and continued, continued to work. So regardless, I think they found a, a workaround. And like George said, a couple of weeks later, I can't believe how nice the song turned out after all the problems we had initially. Yeah. So yeah, it's really kind of uh, they 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 had a way to resolve things. In other words, and sometimes they weren't ha some of them maybe weren't happy about the resolution, but it got resolved and they moved on. 
Yeah, I think the thing about working methods, I, I wasn't trying to say that, that that was all that was going on. Absolutely not. I think mm -hmm. there's obviously, again, you go back to the family thing. I mean, anyone who's in a family, and we all have families, rivalry with your siblings or with family members cuts deeper than anything else. And these guys were unique in that they met when they were very young and they were forced to live this life of seven, eight, ten years together. And they became family, essentially. Mm -hmm. Family with different names. So there was definitely stuff going on. Uh, actually, let me, let me agree with something you said earlier. Though. We do know, we do know something now, which is that certainly at times the Beatles did uh, communicate very candidly. And one of my favourite quotes that I think puts Paul in a very good light is when he says, "You know, I'm very uncomfortable being the leader. Yes, I've been the leader for the last two years. That's pretty damn candid." And yes. we're going to get on to a certain book, which uh, I don't want to lay into too much, but I do have some reservations with the, the book that you showed to the camera earlier. Anyway, we'll get there in a sec. But um, Goldman, uh, in Goldman's book, and we know Goldman's a bit heavy handed, but there's some great humor in his book. He described George as, as like a gas station attendant and John and Paul come into the gas station with their latest hit and George sort of checks the oil and checks the brakes and, you know, puts some gas <laughs> in there. It's very funny, but you can kind of see, you can kind of see what he's saying. It seems like with George, I think, I think he did see the Beatles as a bit of a job for him after a while. That he, His job was lead guitar. And yes, he got to put two or three of his songs on the albums, but I think he considered it a bit of a job. And he probably appreciated the, the, what being in the Beatles gave him, which was you know access to anything he wanted, basically. You know? But exactly. I'd, I definitely would agree that, you know, having spent time with a band and Bob Dylan, because I read a, I read a book actually about um, the basement tapes, and they had such a sort of ramshackle style because mm -hmm. they weren't actually trying to make an album; they were just jamming and mm -hmm. yeah, you know, they they wrote hundreds of songs seemingly. It's actually think, what the Beatles did with "Let It Be, Get Back." It's really the same. Yeah, thing. It's really yeah, that's thing. the it's ironic, isn't it? It kind of works out. Well, being here's the, same, the thing. So. Here's the thing I want to say about that because it is so. It's not a good idea to compare the band of late 1968 to the Beatles of early 69. Now, if Harrison was sitting with the band in 1975, it would have been a hell of a lot worse than he was in January of 69 with the Beatles. It's yeah. all relative. The band was, they were on the right. They were the darlings. Nobody would have heard of those guys without their connection to Dylan. Nobody would have gave a shit. They were, I'm not saying they're overrated, but boy, I'm a little tired of hearing rock stars heap loads of praise on them. But yeah. Harrison was in the warm waters of the band, just like if you were hanging out with the Beatles during a hard day's night, those are the warm water, waters of the Beatles. And you mm -hmm. got to take it in um, some kind of perspective. So naturally, Harrison, you know, what he called the winter of discontent. Yeah, I could see, I can see his perspective completely. Mm -hmm. But he was, I think, not realizing what was going on with either band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the band, uh, yeah, they had a really messy split. They're right in the seventies. They probably caught them at the right time. Yeah, yeah. But I just, I just think, I don't know too much about his relationship with Bob Dylan. But you, I'm sure Dylan did, still had a fairly big ego. I'm sure that was true. But <laughs> I suppose he probably just. I mean, one of the things that Dylan and Harrison wrote a song together, didn't they? Or yes. that may have been that may have been later that year. I can't remember. But perhaps just the idea that, that maybe they involved George Harrison in the songwriting in you know, the band or whatever. Um, yeah, cool. You yeah, disagree I, with me. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I think um, Harrison, uh, boy, this is another big topic. I, I could talk about George Harrison for hours. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Harrison had a very strange approach to his band, The Beatles. And um, as the lead guitarist, I did a video on him putting down his guitar for two years, essentially. So, I mean, what, how, how kind of a, what kind of a lead guitarist is that? I mean, he was just going in a different direction i think maybe he didn't feel comfortable being i mean it's hard to compete with clapton beck page hendrix i mean <laughs> but hey man he, he could have done it in his own way and i don't know why he, i mean there's no safer place in the world than to be a member of the fucking beatles and he didn't use it to his advantage right right i um, I think he was maybe, I feel like this was John Lennon as well. I think they were majorly traumatized by the touring thing. 
I think Paul and Ringo didn't mind it too much, but John Lennon only ever did one full length concert in his solo career. And George didn't, I don't know. I think they had a lot of PTSD from the touring. Maybe so. Because, you know, I, I read uh, one of Jude Sutherland Kessler's books about 1964 and they were already sick of it by then. And then yeah. she writes about all these times that they'd be sleeping and poor old Derek Taylor and Neil Aspinall would have to wake the boys up and go, oh, can you go and meet some dickhead that you're not interested in meeting and take some photos? Can you smile, lads? And yeah, they were totally sick of it by 64, I think oh, the yeah. truth is. Um, so yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think I think the Indian thing just, it obviously had a massively profound effect because yes. George Harrison even went to a place called Varanasi that I was lucky enough to go to in 2019. Mm. He went to Varanasi, which is one of the very holy places on the Ganges in India. And that was one of the last things he ever did in his life. So I think the Indian thing, I think he probably realized, do you think he would have, could have complete, competed with Clapton even if he'd worked hard at it? Well, it, I mean, I use the word compete with. Well, like being at the what, same what level. I suggest, what I would say about George is, hey, how about trying hard? Right. That's right. what I would say because. You, you, you heard the, the songs like Something and Here Comes the Sun and the solo on Let It Be. It's all great work. I mean, he, mm. he's got in his solo year, he's not a, again, he didn't really focus on the guitar as much in his solo but solo career, but there are some solos that are kick ass. He's, he's incredibly talented. Mm. And whatever drove him, I, I don't, I mean, he just maybe didn't want to do it. I, I don't really know, but mm. I, I, I see, I, from, from what I hear of him, he bitches about the Beatles about i you know maybe was held down i think he overplays his hand there and then in the solo career he doesn't expand upon what he was bitching about in the beatles i mean he doesn't if you want to play guitar well play guitar if you want to play sitar play sitar go knock yourself out yeah. he just tried to be singer songwriter he tried to be lennon mccartney and he, yeah he's got some good stuff but i mean not, very few masterpieces very I don't good. know solo stuff enough, really. I mean, I like, I really like all things as pass. And yeah, I, I, I like know the song well, Thirty Three and a Third's a good album. Like, oh, I love I don't that know, album. Don't know I, his stuff too well. Of all the solo stuff, I think I know his work the best, and mm -hmm. um, I do like it. But um, you know, uh, from a guitar standpoint, um, he could have taken it somewhere because I, I hear flashes of brilliance, and he, you know, he just wanted to be the songwriter. I think that's what it seems like. That's what he showed us. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe he just had it in his mind that it was, I don't know, a job. And I, I know you're right. I mean, it's it's probably the best job in the world. But I suppose in a way, maybe it was the worst as well. I, I think maybe it was the worst. But that's the price of fame, you know. I mean, yeah, sure. Talking with, uh, I mean, it, there's discussion of Harrison being an introvert. How how to be an introvert in the Beatles is that's that's a tough. That's tough. So the PTSD yeah. Scott you said talked about uh, that makes some sense to me. Yeah. And I mean, uh, in a funny way, I'm sure people have, well, plenty of people have said this. There's a kind of weird lack of experimentation in the 70s with all of them in a weird way. I mean, I guess I know yeah. John Best obviously tried um, sometime in New York City, which I don't think is a bad album at all. He tried this thing about essentially using newspaper headlines as lyrics. Yeah, He tried a few things. Yeah. Um, um, cool. Yeah. Well, I think... Um, uh, Generally, I mean, they just, their cutting edge time was the 60s. The cutting edge yeah. time in the 70s was left to others. That's the thing. I mean, we've talked about Beatle years before, you know, they had 30 years in about seven years, you know. Yeah. I think, I think there's definitely a case for saying that. I think maybe even the relationships have run their course. Yeah. I think I said that once on my podcast, the John and Paul thing, maybe, maybe too much water had gone under the bridge. You know? Well, yeah, it's, I mean, relationships take marriages. I mean, they tend, the ones that fail, you can kind of say, well, maybe they just did run their course. Mm. And that the ones that last is just a longer course. I mean, John and Paul, uh, the Beatles, there was so much intensity to that relationship and, and, and being in the Beatles that it had to explode and it did. And maybe there was no reconciling. Um, I like yeah. to think that there would have been on there would have been on some level, but it could never have been the camaraderie of the early days. It's just you know you know how it is. I'm, I'm, I I noticed that in my own life, mm. the people I know that I love, that I can't, 
I don't want to spend time with them. <laughs> I love them, but yeah, yeah just yeah, pass okay. it. I got, I got this other stuff I got to do. It's just a maturity thing. And and I, I think our most people's lives probably imitate what the Beatles went through. But for some reason, we think they should have stayed together forever and given us more music. Because what is it? Yeah. We, we want more. <laughs> will, we, will we ever get enough? No. No, we always forget they're human beings. You know, they were yeah, quite special. Human. They're special up to a point, but they're not. That doesn't mean that they're better at handling life than anyone else. Clearly, you know, yeah. a famous person. You know, so yeah. they're only human at the end. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's stop it there, Anthony, and we'll pick up this discussion in the next video. Okay. So, for everybody watching, stay tuned for Anthony Rutuno back on Pop Goes the Sixties coming up next. Mm-hmm.